Nikola Tesla, My Early Life. This is from a publication called Electrical Experimenter Magazine, published in 1919. I will be reading part one, My Early Life, and part two, My Inventions. The progressive development of man is vitally dependent on invention. It is the most important product of his creative brain. Its ultimate purpose is the complete mastery of mind over the material world, the harnessing of the forces of nature to human needs. This is the difficult task of the inventor, who is often misunderstood and unrewarded but he finds ample compensation in the pleasing exercises of his powers and in the knowledge of being one of that exceptionally privileged class without whom the race would have long ago perished in the bitter struggle against pitiless elements. Speaking for myself, I have already had more than my full measure of this exquisite enjoyment, so much that for many years my life was little short of continuous rapture. I am credited with being one of the hardest workers, and perhaps I am, if thought is the equivalent of labor. For I have devoted to it almost all of my waking hours. But if work is interpreted to be a definite performance in a specified time according to a rigid rule, then I may be the worst of idlers. Every effort under compulsion demands a sacrifice of life energy. I never paid such a price. On the contrary, I have thrived on my thoughts. In attempting to give a connected and faithful account of my activities in this series of articles, which will be presented with the assistance of the editors of The Electrical Experimenter, and are chiefly addressed to our young men readers, I must dwell, however, reluctantly on the impressions of my youth, the circumstances and events which have been instrumental in determining my career. Our first endeavors are purely instinctive promptings of an imagination vivid and undisciplined. As we grow older, reason asserts itself, and we become more and more systematic and designing. But those early impulses, though not immediately productive, are of the greatest moment and may shape our very destinies. Indeed, I feel now that had I understood and cultivated instead of suppressing them, I would have added substantial value to my bequest to the world. But not until I had attained manhood did I realize that I was an inventor. This was due to a number of causes. In the first place, I had a brother who was gifted to an extraordinary degree. One of those rare phenomena of mentality which biological investigation has failed to explain. His premature death left my parents disconsolate. We owned a horse which had been presented to us by a dear friend. It was a magnificent animal of Arabian breed, possessed of almost human intelligence, and was cared for and petted by the whole family having on one occasion saved my father's life under remarkable circumstances. My father had been called one winter night to perform an urgent duty, and while crossing the mountains infested by wolves, the horse became frightened and ran away, throwing him violently to the ground. It arrived home, bleeding and exhausted, but after the alarm was sounded, immediately dashed off again, returning to the spot, and before the searching party were far on the way, they were met by my father, who had recovered consciousness and remounted, not realizing that he had been lying in the snow for several hours. This horse was responsible for my brother's injuries from which he died. I witnessed the tragic scene, and although fifty-six years have elapsed since, my visual impression of it has lost none of its force. 
The recollection of his attainments made every effort of mine seem dull in comparison. Anything I did that was creditable merely caused my parents to feel their loss more keenly, so I grew up with little confidence in myself. But I was far from being considered a stupid boy if I am to judge from an incident of which I have still a strong remembrance. One day, the aldermen were passing through a street where I was at play with other boys. The oldest of these venerable gentlemen, a wealthy citizen, paused to give a silver piece to each of us. Coming to me, he suddenly stopped and commanded, look in my eyes. I met his gaze, my hand outstretched to receive the much valued coin, when, to my dismay, he said, no, not much, you can get nothing from me, you are too smart. They used to tell a funny story about me. I had two old aunts with wrinkled faces, one of them having two teeth protruding like the tusks of an elephant, which she buried in my cheek every time she kissed me. Nothing would scare me more than the prospect of being hugged by these as affectionate as unattractive relatives. It happened that while being carried in my mother's arms, they asked me who was the prettier of the two. After examining their faces intently, I answered thoughtfully, pointing to one of them, this here is not as ugly as the other. Then again, I was intended from my very birth for the clerical profession, and this thought constantly oppressed me. I longed to be an engineer, but my father was inflexible. He was the son of an officer who served in the army of the great Napoleon and in common with his brother, professor of mathematics in a prominent institution, had received a military education, but, singularly enough, later embraced the clergy in which vocation he achieved eminence. He was a very erudite man, a veritable natural philosopher, poet, and writer, and his sermons were said to be as eloquent as those of Abraham a Sancta Clara. He had a prodigious memory, and frequently recited at length from works in several languages. He often remarked playfully that if some of the classics were lost, he could restore them. His style of writing was much admired. He penned sentences short and terse, and was full of wit and satire. The humorous remarks he made were always peculiar and characteristic. Just to illustrate, I may mention one or two instances. Among the help, there was a cross-eyed man called Maine, employed to do work around the farm. He was chopping wood one day. As he swung the axe, my father, who stood nearby and felt very uncomfortable, cautioned him, for God's sake, Maine, do not strike at what you are looking, but at what you intend to hit. On another occasion, he was taking out for a drive a friend who carelessly permitted his costly fur coat to rub on the carriage wheel. My father reminded him of it, saying, Pull in your coat, you're ruining my tire. He had the odd habit of talking to himself, and would often carry on an animated conversation and indulge in heated argument, changing the tone of his voice. A casual listener might have sworn that several people were in the room. Although I must trace to my mother's influence whatever inventiveness I possess, the training he gave me must have been helpful. It comprised all sorts of exercises, as guessing one another's thoughts, discovering the defects of some form or expression, repeating long sentences, or performing mental calculations. These daily lessons were intended to strengthen memory and reason, and especially to develop the critical sense, and were undoubtedly very beneficial. My mother descended from one of the oldest families in the country and a line of inventors. Both her father and grandfather originated numerous implements for household, agricultural, and other uses. She was a truly great woman of rare skill, courage, and fortitude, who had braved the storms of life and passed through many a trying experience. When she was 16, a virulent pestilence swept the country. 
her father was called away to administer the last sacraments to the dying, and during his absence she went alone to the assistance of a neighboring family who were stricken by the dread disease. All of the members, five in number, succumbed in rapid succession. She bathed, clothed, and laid out the bodies, decorating them with flowers according to the custom of the country. And when her father returned, he found everything ready for a Christian burial. My mother was an inventor of the first order and would, I believe, have achieved great things had she not been so remote from modern life and its multifold opportunities. She invented and constructed all kinds of tools and devices and wove the finest designs from thread which was spun by her. She even planted the seeds, raised the plants, and separated the fibers herself. She worked indefatigably from break of day till late at night, and most of the wearing apparel and furnishings of the home was the product of her hands. When she was past 60, her fingers were still nimble enough to tie three knots in an eyelash. There was another and still more important reason for my late awakening. In my boyhood, I suffered from a peculiar affliction due to the appearance of images, often accompanied by strong flashes of light, which marred the sight of real objects and interfered with my thought and action. They were pictures of things and scenes which I had really seen, never of those I imagined, when a word was spoken to me, the image of the object it designated would present itself vividly to my vision, and sometimes I was quite unable to distinguish whether what I saw was tangible or not. This caused me great discomfort and anxiety. None of the students of psychology or physiology whom I have consulted could ever explain satisfactorily these phenomena. They seem to have been unique, although I was probably predisposed, as I know that my brother experienced a similar trouble. The theory I have formulated is that the images were the result of a reflex action from the brain on the retina under great excitation. They certainly were not hallucinations, such as are produced in diseased and anguished minds, for in other respects, I was normal and composed. To give an idea of my distress, suppose that I had witnessed a funeral or some such nerve-wracking spectacle. Then, inevitably, in the stillness of night, a vivid picture of the scene would thrust itself before my eyes and persist despite all my efforts to banish it. Sometimes it would even remain fixed in space, though I pushed my hands through it. If my explanation is correct, it should be possible to project on a screen the image of any object one conceives and make it visible. Such an advance would revolutionize all human relations. I am convinced that this wonder can and will be accompanied in time to come. I may add that I have devoted much thought to the solution of the problem. To free myself of these tormenting appearances, I tried to concentrate my mind on something else I had seen, and in this way I would often obtain temporary relief. But in order to get it, I had to conjure continuously new images. It was not long before I found that I had exhausted all of those at my command. My reel had run out, as it were, because I had seen little of the world, only objects in my home and the immediate surroundings. As I performed these mental operations for the second or third time in order to chase the appearances from my vision, the remedy gradually lost all its force. Then I instinctively commenced to make excursions beyond the limits of the small world of which I had knowledge and I saw new scenes. These were at first very blurred and indistinct, and would flit away when I tried to concentrate my attention upon them. But by and by I succeeded in fixing them. They gained in strength and distinctness, and finally assumed the concreteness of real things. 
I soon discovered that my best comfort was attained if I simply went on in my vision farther and farther, getting new impressions all the time. And so I began to travel, of course, in my mind. Every night, and sometimes during the day, when alone, I would start on my journeys, see new places, cities, and countries, live there, meet people and make friendships and acquaintances, and however unbelievable, it is a fact that they were just as dear to me as those in actual life, and not a bit less intense in their manifestations. This I did constantly until I was about 17, when my thoughts turned seriously to invention. Then I observed to my delight that I could visualize with the greatest facility. I needed no models, drawings, or experiments. I could picture them all as real in my mind. Thus I have been led unconsciously to evolve what I consider a new method of materializing inventive concepts and ideas, which is radically opposite to the purely experimental and is, in my opinion, ever so much more expeditious and efficient. The moment one constructs a device to carry into practice a crude idea, he finds himself unavoidably engrossed with the details and defects of the apparatus. As he goes on improving and reconstructing, his force of concentration diminishes, and he loses sight of the great underlying principle. Results may be obtained, but always at the sacrifice of quality. My method is different. I do not rush into actual work. When I get an idea, I start at once building it up in my imagination. I change the construction, make improvements, and operate the device in my mind. It is absolutely immaterial to me whether I run my turbine in thought or test it in my shop. I even note if it is out of balance. There is no difference whatever. The results are the same. In this way, I am able to rapidly develop and perfect a conception without touching anything. When I have gone so far as to embody in the invention every possible improvement I can think of and see no fault anywhere, I put into concrete form this final product of my brain. Invariably, my device works as I conceived that it should, and the experiment comes out exactly as I planned it. In 20 years, there has not been a single exception. Why should it be otherwise? Engineering, electrical and mechanical, is positive in results. There is scarcely a subject that cannot be mathematically treated and the effects calculated or the results determined beforehand from the available theoretical and practical data. The carrying out into practice of a crude idea as is being generally done is, I hold, nothing but a waste of energy, money, and time. My early affliction had, however, another compensation. The incessant mental exertion developed my powers of observation and enabled me to discover a truth of great importance. I had noted that the appearance of images was always preceded by actual vision of scenes under peculiar and generally very exceptional conditions, and I was impelled on each occasion to locate the original impulse. After a while, this effort grew to be almost automatic and I gained great facility in connecting cause and effect. Soon I became aware, to my surprise, that every thought I conceived was suggested by an external impression. Not only this, but all my actions were prompted in a similar way. In the course of time, it became perfectly evident to me that I was merely an automaton endowed with power of movement, responding to the stimuli of the sense organs, and thinking and acting accordingly. The practical result of this was the art of teleautomatics, which has been so far carried out only in an imperfect manner. Its latent possibilities will, however, be eventually shown. I have been since years planning self-controlled automata, 
and believe that mechanisms can be produced which will act as if possessed of reason to a limited degree and will create a revolution in many commercial and industrial departments. I was about 12 years old when I first succeeded in banishing an image from my vision by willful effort, but I never had any control over the flashes of light to which I have referred. They were, perhaps, my strangest experience and inexplicable. They usually occurred when I found myself in a dangerous or distressing situation, or when I was greatly exhilarated. In some instances, I have seen all the air around me filled with tongues of living flame. Their intensity, instead of diminishing, increased with time and seemingly attained a maximum when I was about 25 years old. While in Paris in 1883, a prominent French manufacturer sent me an invitation to a shooting expedition, which I accepted. I had been long confined to the factory and the fresh air had a wonderfully invigorating effect on me. On my return to the city that night, I felt a positive sensation that my brain had caught fire. I saw a light as though a small sun was located in it, and I passed the whole night applying cold compressions to my tortured head. Finally, the flashes diminished in frequency and force, but it took more than three weeks before they wholly subsided. When a second invitation was extended to me, my answer was an emphatic no. These luminous phenomena still manifest themselves from time to time, as when a new idea opening up possibilities strikes me, but they are no longer exciting, being a relatively small intensity. When I close my eyes, I invariably observe first a background of very dark and uniform blue, not unlike the sky on a clear but starless night. In a few seconds, this field becomes animated with innumerable scintillating flakes of green, arranged in several layers and advancing towards me. Then there appears to the right a beautiful pattern of two systems of parallel and closely spaced lines at right angles to one another in all sorts of colors with yellow, green, and gold predominating. Immediately thereafter, the lines grow brighter and the whole is thickly sprinkled with dots of twinkling light. This picture moves slowly across the field of vision and in about 10 seconds vanishes to the left, leaving behind a ground of rather unpleasant and inert gray, which quickly gives way to a billowy sea of clouds, seemingly trying to mold themselves in living shapes. It is curious that I cannot project a form into this gray until the second phase is reached. Every time before falling asleep, images of persons or objects flit before my view. When I see them, I know that I am about to lose consciousness. If they are absent and refuse to come, it means a sleepless night. To what an extent imagination played a part in my early life, I may illustrate by another odd experience. Like most children, I was fond of jumping and developing an intense desire to support myself in the air. Occasionally, a strong wind richly charged with oxygen blew from the mountains, rendering my body as light as cork, and then I would leap and float in space for a long time. It was a delightful sensation, and my disappointment was keen when later I undeceived myself. During that period, I contracted many strange likes, dislikes, and habits, some of which I can trace to external impressions, while others are unaccountable. I had a violent aversion against the earrings of women, but other ornaments, as bracelets, pleased me more or less according to design. The sight of a pearl would almost give me a fit but I was fascinated with the glitter of crystals or objects with sharp edges and plain surfaces. I would not touch the hair of other people except perhaps at the point of a revolver. I would get a fever by looking at a peach and if a piece of camphor was anywhere in the house, it caused me the keenest discomfort. Even now, I am not insensible to some of these upsetting impulses. When I drop little squares of paper in a dish filled with liquid, 
I always sense a peculiar and awful taste in my mouth. I counted the steps in my walks and calculated the cubicle contents of soup plates, coffee cups, and pieces of food. Otherwise, my meal was unenjoyable. All repeated acts or operations I performed had to be divisible by three, and if I missed, I felt impelled to do it all over again, even if it took hours. Up to the age of eight years, my character was weak and vacillating. I had neither courage or strength to form a firm resolve. My feelings came in waves and surges and vibrated unceasingly between extremes. My wishes were of consuming force, and like the heads of the hydra, they multiplied. I was oppressed by thoughts of pain in life and death and religious fear. I was swayed by superstitious belief and lived in constant dread of the spirit of evil, of ghosts and ogres and other unholy monsters of the dark. Then all at once there came a tremendous change which altered the course of my whole existence. Of all things, I liked books the best. My father had a large library, and whenever I could manage, I tried to satisfy my passion for reading. He did not permit it and would fly into a rage when he caught me in the act. He hid the candles when he found that I was reading in secret. He did not want me to spoil my eyes, but I obtained tallow, made the wicking and cast the sticks into tin forms, and every night I would bush the keyhole and the cracks and read, often till dawn, when all others slept, and my mother started on her arduous daily task. On one occasion I came across a novel entitled Abafi, the son of Abba, a Serbian translation of a well-known Hungarian writer, Josika. This work somehow awakened my dormant powers of will, and I began to practice self-control. At first, my resolutions faded like snow in April, but in a little while, I conquered my weakness and felt a pleasure I never knew before, that of doing as I willed. In the course of time, this vigorous mental exercise became second nature. At the outset, my wishes had to be subdued, but gradually desire and will grew to be identical. After years of such discipline, I gained so complete a mastery over myself that I toyed with passions which have meant destruction to some of the strongest men. At a certain age, I contracted a mania for gambling, which greatly worried my parents. To sit down to a game of cards was for me the quintessence of pleasure. My father led an exemplary life and could not excuse the senseless waste of time and money in which I indulged. I had a strong resolve, but my philosophy was bad. I would say to him, I can stop whenever I please, but is it worthwhile to give up that which I would purchase with the joys of paradise? On frequent occasions, he gave vent to his anger and contempt, but my mother was different. She understood the character of men and knew that one's salvation could only be brought about through his own efforts. One afternoon, I remember, when I had lost all my money and was craving for a game, she came to me with a roll of bills and said, Go and enjoy yourself. The sooner you lose all we possess, the better it will be. I know that you will get over it. She was right. I conquered my passion then and there, and only regretted that it had not been a hundred times as strong. I not only vanquished, but tore it from my heart so as not to leave even a trace of desire. Ever since that time, I have been as indifferent to any form of gambling as to picking teeth. During another period, I smoked excessively, threatening to ruin my health. Then my will asserted itself, and I not only stopped, but destroyed all inclination. Long ago, I suffered from heart trouble until I discovered that it was due to the innocent cup of coffee I consumed every morning. I discontinued at once, though I confess it was not an easy task. In this way I checked and bridled other habits and passions, and have not only preserved my life, but derived an immense amount of satisfaction from what most men would consider privation and sacrifice. After finishing the studies at the Polytechnic Institute and University, I had a complete nervous breakdown, and while the malady lasted, 
I observed many phenomena strange and unbelievable. Part 2. My First Efforts in Invention I shall dwell briefly on these extraordinary experiences on account of their possible interest to students of psychology and physiology and also because this period of agony was of the greatest consequence on my mental development and subsequent labors. But it is indispensable to first relate the circumstances and conditions which preceded them and in which might be found their partial explanation. From childhood I was compelled to concentrate attention upon myself. This caused me much suffering, but to my present view it was a blessing in disguise, for it has taught me to appreciate the inestimable value of introspection in the preservation of life, as well as a means of achievement. The pressure of occupation and the incessant stream of impressions pouring into our consciousness through all the gateways of knowledge make modern existence hazardous in many ways. Most persons are so absorbed in the contemplation of the outside world that they are wholly oblivious to what is passing on within themselves. The premature death of millions is primarily traceable to this cause. Even among those who exercise care, it is a common mistake to avoid imaginary and ignore the real dangers. And what is true of an individual also applies more or less to a people as a whole. Witness in illustration the prohibition movement. A drastic if not unconstitutional measure is now being put through in this country to prevent the consumption of alcohol and yet it is a positive fact that coffee, tea, tobacco, chewing gum, and other stimulants, which are freely indulged in even at the tender age, are vastly more injurious to the national body, judging from the number of those who succumb. So, for instance, during my student years, I gathered from the published necrologues in Vienna, the home of coffee drinkers, that deaths from heart trouble sometimes reached 67% of the total. Similar observations might probably be made in cities where the consumption of tea is excessive. These delicious beverages super excite and gradually exhaust the fine fibers of the brain. They also interfere seriously with arterial circulation and should be enjoyed all the more sparingly as their deleterious effects are slow and imperceptible. Tobacco, on the other hand, is conducive to easy and pleasant thinking and detracts from the intensity and concentration necessary to all original and vigorous effort of the intellect. Chewing gum is helpful for a short while but soon drains the glandular system and inflicts irreparable damage, not to speak of the revulsion it creates. Alcohol in small quantities is an excellent tonic, but is toxic in its action when absorbed in larger amounts, quite immaterial as to whether it is taken in as whiskey or produced in the stomach from sugar. But it should not be overlooked that all of these are great eliminators, assisting nature, as they do, in upholding her stern but just law of the survival of the fittest. Eager reformers should also be mindful of the eternal perversity of mankind, which makes the indifferent laissez-faire by far preferable to enforced restraint. The truth about this is that we need stimulants to do our best work under present living conditions, and that we must exercise moderation and control our appetites and inclinations in every direction. That is what I have been doing for many years in this way maintaining myself young in body and mind. Abstinence was not always to my liking, but I find ample reward in the agreeable experiences I am now making, just in the hope of converting some to my precepts and convictions, I will recall one or two. A short time ago, I was returning to my hotel. It was a bitter cold night, the ground slippery, and no taxi to be had. Half a block behind me followed another man, evidently as anxious as myself, to get under cover 
Suddenly, my legs went up in the air. In the same instant, there was a flash in my brain. The nerves responded, the muscles contracted. I swung through 180 degrees and landed on my hands. I resumed my walk as though nothing had happened. When the stranger caught up with me, how old are you? He asked, surveying me critically. Oh, about 59, I replied. What of it? Well, said he, I have seen a cat do this, but never a man. About a month since, I wanted to order new eyeglasses and went to an oculist to put me through the usual tests. He looked at me incredulously as I read off with ease the smallest print at considerable distance. But when I told him that I was past 60, he gasped in astonishment. Friends of mine often remark that my suits fit me like gloves, but they do not know that all my clothing is made to measurements which were taken nearly 35 years ago and never changed. During this same period, my weight has not varied one pound. In this connection, I may tell a funny story. One evening in the winter of 1885, Mr. Edison, Edward H. Johnson, the president of the Edison Illuminating Company, Mr. Bachelor, manager of the works, and myself, entered a little place opposite 65 Fifth Avenue, where the offices of the company were located. Someone suggested guessing weights, and I was induced to step on a scale. Edison felt me all over and said, Tesla weighs 152 pounds to an ounce and he guessed it exactly. Stripped, I weighed 142 pounds, and that is still my weight. I whispered to Mr. Johnson, how is it possible that Edison could guess my weight so closely? Well, he said, lowering his voice, I will tell you confidentially, but you must not say anything. He was employed for a long time in a Chicago slaughterhouse where he weighed thousands of hogs every day. That's why. My friend, the Honorable Chauncey M. Depew, tells of an Englishman on whom he sprung one of his original anecdotes and who listened with a puzzled expression, but a year later laughed out loud. I will frankly confess it took me longer than that to appreciate Johnson's joke. Now, my well-being is simply the result of a careful and measured mode of living, and perhaps the most astonishing thing is that three times in my youth I was rendered by illness a hopeless physical wreck and given up by physicians. More than this, through ignorance and lightheartedness, I got into all sorts of difficulties, dangers and scrapes from which I extricated myself as by enchantment. I was almost drowned a dozen times, was nearly boiled alive, and just missed being cremated. I was entombed, lost and frozen, I had hairbreadth escapes from mad dogs, hogs, and other wild animals. I passed through dreadful diseases and met with all kinds of odd mishaps, and that I am hale and hearty today seems like a miracle. But as I recall these incidents to my mind, I feel convinced that my preservation was not altogether accidental. An inventor's endeavor is essentially life-saving. Whether he harnesses forces, improves devices, or provides new comforts and conveniences, he is adding to the safety of our existence. He is also better qualified than the average individual to protect himself in peril, for he is observant and resourceful. If I had no other evidence that I was in a measure possessed of such qualities, I would find it in these personal experiences. The reader will be able to judge for himself if I mention one or two instances. On one occasion, when about 14 years old, I wanted to scare some friends who were bathing with me. My plan was to dive under a long floating structure and slip out quietly at the other end. Swimming and diving came to me as naturally as to a duck, and I was confident that I could perform the feat. Accordingly, I plunged into the water and when out of view, turned around and proceeded rapidly towards the opposite side. Thinking that I was safely beyond the structure, I rose to the surface, but to my dismay, struck a beam. Of course, I quickly dived and forged ahead with rapid strokes until my breath was beginning to give out. 
Rising for the second time, my head came again in contact with a beam. Now I was becoming desperate. However, summoning all my energy, I made a third frantic attempt, but the result was the same. The torture of suppressed breathing was getting unendurable. My brain was reeling and I felt myself sinking. At that moment, when my situation seemed absolutely hopeless, I experienced one of those flashes of light and the structure above me appeared before my vision. I either discerned or guessed that there was a little space between the surface of the water and the boards resting on the beams, and with consciousness nearly gone, I floated up, pressed my mouth close to the planks, and managed to inhale a little air, unfortunately mingled with a spray of water which nearly choked me. Several times I repeated this procedure as in a dream until my heart, which was racing at a terrible rate, quieted down and I gained composure. After that, I made a number of unsuccessful dives, having completely lost the sense of direction, but finally succeeded in getting out of the trap when my friends had already given me up and were fishing for my body. That bathing season was spoiled for me through recklessness, but I soon forgot the lesson, and only two years later I fell into a worse predicament. There was a large flour mill with a dam across the river near the city where I was studying at that time. As a rule, the height of the water was only two or three inches above the dam, and to swim out to it was a sport not very dangerous in which I often indulged. One day I went alone to the river to enjoy myself as usual. When I was a short distance from the masonry, however, I was horrified to observe that the water had risen and was carrying me along swiftly. I tried to get away, but it was too late. Luckily, though, I saved myself from being swept over by taking hold of the wall with both hands. The pressure against my chest was great, and I was barely able to keep my head above the surface. Not a soul was in sight, and my voice was lost in the roar of the fall. Slowly and gradually, I became exhausted and unable to withstand the strain longer. Just as I was about to let go, to be dashed against the rocks below, I saw in a flash of light a familiar diagram illustrating the hydraulic principle that the pressure of a fluid in motion is proportionate to the area exposed, and automatically I turned on my left side. As if by magic, the pressure was reduced and I found it comparatively easy in that position to resist the force of the stream. But the danger still confronted me. I knew that sooner or later I would be carried down as it was not possible for any help to reach me in time, even if I attracted attention. I am ambidextrous now, but then I was left-handed and had comparatively little strength in my right arm. For this reason, I did not dare to turn on the other side to rest and nothing remained but to slowly push my body along the dam. I had to get away from the mill towards which my face was turned as the current there was much swifter and deeper. It was a long and painful ordeal and I came near to failing at its very end for I was confronted with the depression in the masonry. I managed to get over with the last ounce of my force and fell in a swoon when I reached the bank where I was found. I had torn virtually all the skin from my left side, and it took several weeks before the fever subsided and I was well. These are only two of many instances, but they may be sufficient to show that had it not been for the inventor's instinct, I would not have lived to tell this tale. Interested people have often asked me how and when I began to invent. This I can only answer from my present recollection, in the light of which the first attempt I recall was rather ambitious, for it involved the invention of an apparatus and a method. In the former I was anticipated, but the latter was original. It happened in this way. One of my playmates had come into the possession of a hook and fishing tackle, which created quite an excitement in the village, and the next morning all started out to catch frogs. I was left alone and deserted owing to a quarrel with this boy. I had never seen a real hook and pictured it as something wonderful, endowed with peculiar qualities, 
and was despairing not to be one of the party. Urged by necessity, I somehow got hold of a piece of soft iron wire, hammered the end to a sharp point between two stones, bent it into shape, and fastened it to a strong string. I then cut a rod, gathered some bait, and went down to the brook where there were frogs in abundance. But I could not catch any and was almost discouraged when it occurred to me to dangle the empty hook in front of a frog sitting on a stump. At first he collapsed, but by and by his eyes bulged out and became bloodshot. He swelled to twice his normal size and made a vicious snap at the hook. Immediately I pulled him up. I tried the same thing again and again and the method proved infallible. When my comrades, who in spite of their fine outfit had caught nothing, came to me, they were green with envy. For a long time I kept my secret and enjoyed the monopoly, but finally yielded to the spirit of Christmas. Every boy could then do the same, and the following summer brought disaster to the frogs. In my next attempt, I seem to have acted under the first instinctive impulse which later dominated me, to harness the energies of nature to the service of man. I did this through the medium of maybugs, or June bugs as they are called in America, which were a veritable pest in that country and sometimes broke the branches of trees by the sheer weight of their bodies. The bushes were black with them. I would attach as many as four of them to a cross piece, rotably arranged on a thin spindle and transmit the motion of the same to a large disk, and so derive considerable power. These creatures were remarkably efficient, for once they were started they had no sense to stop and continued whirling for hours and hours, and the hotter it was, the harder they worked. All went well until a strange boy came to the place. He was the son of a retired officer in the Austrian army. That urchin ate maybugs alive and enjoyed them as though they were the finest blue point oysters. That disgusting sight terminated my endeavors in this promising field, and I have never since been able to touch a maybug or any other insect for that matter. After that, I believe, I undertook to take apart and assemble the clocks of my grandfather. In the former operation, I was always successful but often failed in the latter. So it came that he brought my work to a sudden halt in a manner not too delicate, and it took 30 years before I tackled another clockwork again. Shortly thereafter, I went into the manufacture of a kind of pop gun, which comprised a hollow tube, a piston, and two plugs of hemp. When firing the gun, the piston was pressed against the stomach, and the tube was pushed back quickly with both hands. The air between the plugs was compressed and raised to high temperature, and one of them was expelled with a loud report. The art consisted in selecting a tube of the proper taper from the hollow stalks, which did very well with that gun, but my activities interfered with the window panes in our house and met with painful discouragement. If I remember rightly, I then took to carving swords from pieces of furniture which I could conveniently obtain. At that time, I was under the sway of the Serbian national poetry and full of admiration for the feats of the heroes. I used to spend hours in mowing down my enemies in the form of corn stalks, which ruined the crops and netted me several spankings from my mother. Moreover, these were not of the formal kind, but the genuine article. I had all this and more behind me before I was six years old and had passed through one year of elementary school in the village of Smiljan, where I was born. At this juncture we moved to the little city of Gospic, nearby. This change of residence was like a calamity to me. It almost broke my heart to part from our pigeons, chickens and sheep, and our magnificent flock of geese, which used to rise to the clouds in the morning and return from the feeding grounds at sundown in battle formation, so perfect that it would have put a squadron of the best aviators of the present day to shame. In our new house, I was but a prisoner, watching the strange people I saw through the window blinds. 
My bashfulness was such that I would rather have faced a roaring lion than one of the city dudes who strolled about. But my hardest trial came on Sunday when I had to dress up and attend the service. There I met with an accident, the mere thought of which made my blood curdle like sour milk for years afterwards. It was my second adventure in a church. Not long before, I was entombed for a night in an old chapel on an inaccessible mountain, which was visited only once a year. It was an awful experience, but this one was worse. There was a wealthy lady in town, a good but pompous woman, who used to come to the church gorgeously painted up and attired with an enormous train and attendance. One Sunday, I had just finished ringing the bell in the belfry and rushed downstairs when this grand dame was sweeping out and I jumped on her train. It tore off with a ripping noise which sounded like a salvo of musketry fired by raw recruits. My father was livid with rage. He gave me a gentle slap on the cheek, the only corporal punishment he ever administered to me, but I almost feel it now. The embarrassment and confusion that followed are indescribable. I was practically ostracized until something else happened which redeemed me in the estimation in the community. An enterprising young merchant had organized a fire department. A new fire engine was purchased, uniforms provided, and the men drilled for service and parade. The engine was, in reality, a pump to be worked by 16 men and was beautifully painted red and black. One afternoon, the official trial was prepared for and the machine was transported to the river. The entire population turned out to witness the great spectacle. When all the speeches and ceremonies were concluded, the command was given to pump, but not a drop of water came from the nozzle. The professors and experts tried in vain to locate the trouble. The fizzle was complete when I arrived at the scene. My knowledge of the mechanism was nil, and I knew next to nothing of air pressure. But instinctively, I felt for the suction hose in the water and found that it had collapsed. When I waded in the river and opened it up, the water rushed forth, and not a few Sunday clothes were spoiled. Archimedes, running naked through the streets of Syracuse and shouting Eureka at the top of his voice, did not make a greater impression than myself. I was carried on the shoulders and was the hero of the day. Upon settling in the city, I began a four years course in the so-called normal school preparatory to my studies at the College of Real Gymnasium. During this period, my boyish efforts and exploits, as well as troubles, continued. Among other things, I attained the unique distinction of champion crow catcher in the country. My method of procedure was extremely simple. I would go into the forest, hide in the bushes, and imitate the call of the bird. Usually I would get several answers, and in a short while, a crow would flutter down into the shrubbery near me. After that, all I needed to do was to throw a piece of cardboard to detract its attention, jump up and grab it before it could extricate itself from the undergrowth. In this way, I would capture as many as I desired. But on one occasion, something occurred which made me respect them. I had caught a fine pair of birds and was returning home with a friend. When we left the forest, thousands of crows had gathered making a frightful racket. In a few minutes, they rose in pursuit and soon enveloped us. The fun lasted until all of a sudden I received a blow on the back of my head which knocked me down. Then they attacked me viciously. I was compelled to release the two birds and was glad to join my friend who had taken refuge in a cave. In the schoolroom, there were a few mechanical models which interested me and turned my attention to water turbines. I constructed many of these and found great pleasure in operating them. How extraordinary was my life, an incident may illustrate. My uncle had no use for this kind of pastime and more than once rebuked me. I was fascinated by a description of Niagara Falls I had perused and pictured in my imagination a big wheel run by the falls. I told my uncle that I would go to America and carry out this scheme. 
30 years later, I saw my ideas carried out at Niagara and marveled at the unfathomable mystery of the mind. I made all kinds of other contrivances and contraptions, but among these, the arbalists I produced were the best. My arrows, when shot, disappeared from sight, and at close range traversed a plank of pine one inch thick. Through the continuous tightening of the bows, I developed skin on my stomach very much like that of a crocodile, and I am often wondering whether it's due to this exercise that I am able even now to digest cobblestones. Nor can I pass in silence my performances with the sling which have enabled me to give a stunning exhibit at the Hippodrome. And now I will tell of one of my feats with this antique implement of war which will strain to the utmost the credulity of the reader. I was practicing while walking with my uncle along the river. The sun was setting, the trout were playful, and from time to time one would shoot up into the air, its glistening body sharply defined against a projecting rock beyond. Of course any boy might have hit a fish under these propitious conditions, but I undertook a much more difficult task, and I foretold to my uncle, to the minutest detail, what I intended doing. I was to hurl a stone to meet the fish, press its body against the rock, and cut it in two. It was no sooner said than done. My uncle looked at me almost scared out of his wits and exclaimed, Vade Rachel Satanas, or go away Satan, and it was a few days before he spoke to me again. Other records, however great, will be eclipsed but I feel that I could peacefully rest on my laurels for a thousand years.